We're now wandering down towards Fell Grove. This is the interesting part about this. I couldn't get any response to the burials that we thought as to why it was called Bell Grove and that piece of ground wasn't allocated to that pro property there, but that property seemed to want to plant a tree in the middle there in the long past. And I discovered that there's a code for unblocking things because the priests in ancient times hid things by putting a blocking Thing on them so when your mind comes along it can't pick it up so I unblocked it and the whole thing came alive <laughs> and uh, basically I then worked and found that there were at least six little alien burials down there as a result of some crash that had happened in thousands and thousands of years ago and that's where their stains are the arrowhead burial there yeah pointing to single female burial here which is we dated about eight and a half thousand years but these 42s are about eleven and a half thousand years so obviously the more modern humans have got knowledge of this therefore wanting to tell people the only way they could because they didn't write anything down <laughs> now i think this is what they were pointing to because that arrow also points across wellington rocks well let me put it this way, allowing for the fact that the sandstone has eroded from there and slightly down here, we have the perfect image of a UFO in sandstone and it's perfectly round when you look from the top down with a turret in the middle. However, the Crockford team came down and said it was much, much bigger during the Bronze Age and it had been reconfigured in the Iron Age. This 2013 recording was made during a field trip to Wellington Rocks and there is a lot of background sound interference, but you can still appreciate what is being tested and see the results. What was that number again, Peter? 9726458. Here again, here we are. Another one here. Right here. As you show responses to titanium as well, you were uh, well and truly dusted with it. See, if you put anything on the ground, 
leave stains in the ground of what had been on it. Right. So a lot of titanium here left for a long time. One, two, three, four, nine, five, one. Well, there's a, a response there. Responses to titanium. This is so soft, this stone, that it just erodes and it turns back into sand. So, unless somebody says we're going to protect this, it'll just erode to nothing and all the knowledge will go. So, we're right. looking at so, a yeah. lot of codes. Yeah. Codes, here yeah. Created. So, the top left is uranium. That code means that there's been a nuclear explosion. This is radiation. That is bronze. That is iridium. This is non earthly metals. Those we call xyluminium, which I think is maybe a form of aluminium, and oxysorus, whatever that is, I'm not sure, that's how they wanted us to spell it. It could be an outer layer of a craft. This measures space and time, that measures levitation, that is a code for matter outside the universe. Now when I mean about outside the universe, we've discovered that the universe is made up of five sections, and only two are linked. That's carbon fibre, carbon fibre. One of the contacts I had, he had a sports car. And I said to him, I'll, I'll try and uh, see if I can follow you back home. So I followed him back home and when he came in the shop, I showed him on the map where he was and he wasn't uh, none too pleased about it. <laughs> because his car was made of carbon fibre. Okay. Well, it's remote viewing, isn't it? Remote viewing, yeah, 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 just followed the car, yeah. So a grove normally is named after a Saxon burial ground. So therefore you automatically start looking for burials. But you know. we didn't expect <laughs> the burials that we found here. But if we look at the archaeology that's going on in the town by other groups, they're finding things that are just as important as Stonehenge, things on the same alignment as Stonehenge. We had a stone circle in the Calverley grounds, which was broken up in the late 1970s. But lucky enough we found some photographs showing some of these standing stones. So one has to say, well, why it was there? Well, when you look at it in the context of everything else, and we know there are burials under there as well, and other things. Even though the standing stones were deliberately removed and smashed, there are still the stains left in the ground that can be detected. So nil point to those who think they've hidden the fact. Because the stains are still there, <laughs> therefore these colours will bring them all out. I've been a resident in this town since 1969. I witnessed, 1974-5, the area of what was a stone circle of being smashed up by the park keepers under the instructions of the council. Mr Ashby, who was the head park keeper, he broke up a lot of sandstone, smaller sandstones, and put them into this sort of layout here. And there's also some round supporting. Um, on the top of the mound up there was a different type of sarsen stone, which was very whitish in colour, very heavy and extremely difficult to break up. Now in 69 when I arrived they were stones recumbent with a dolmen stone in the middle and until 74-5 when this lot was smashed up and cleared to what we see today is just a grass mound and then in 1979 apparently the act was changed which would have made that illegal to do. Now this mound, I know it just looks like an ordinary rockery now, um, is in fact marked on the 1808 town map as a mound and at the foot of the mound there used to flow a stream and that is also marked on the 1808 map and the stream is in fact um, the upper reaches of the river Brom which, um, which uh, flows out in, eventually into the river Medway. This mound is in fact very very ancient it goes back probably to the Bronze Age, when, which was a time when people were making stone circles and other features of that nature. So it is in fact an ancient monument, but unfortunately over the years it has been vandalised and neglected and ignored and eventually almost swept away by the council itself. English Heritage have failed in their duty to protect this site and they must bear a heavy responsibility for this destruction. At the top of the mound there was a feature which locals called a dolmen which probably was a long barrow in fact. So if it was the case of it was a long barrow it goes back to the Neolithic which is the, the new stone age. 
We're talking about 5,000 or more years old. It may be Bronze Age, we can't be certain. We need archaeologists to tell us exactly how old it is. But it's certainly an ancient monument by any definition of the word. And it is protected by law. It should be protected by law as all ancient monuments are. It can only be described as official vandalism of what's happened here. The following is a cassette taped interview from 19th May 2004 with an elderly Arthur Ashby which has been digitised. The sound quality is poor but original and we believe an important testimony about an important part of Tunbridge Wells' history. Associated with the breakup of the stones are reports of mysterious mishaps and even death, especially the curse that Arthur refers to and a special stone he calls the Holy Stone. It's nice of you to call in, Mr. Ashby, Arthur. Arthur, yeah, I'm yeah. Lisa. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a few questions following the statement you gave us on the 29th of August 2003 in respect to the uh, clearance in Calvary grounds when you were head park keeper. You were formerly working for the council yeah. in a certain capacity, then were transferred to the grounds groundsman, head park keeper of yeah, the county grounds. I was starting off as a groundsman. Yeah. Now, you said you'd worked for 38 years for the council. Yep. Yeah. You did most of your work when you were on the parks in the Calvary grounds, and that you could recall below what is now the PPP offices, an area where there were large standing stones sighted. I think there was 40 odd stones there. And then... You also mentioned that several of the stones were too big. Uh, one of them about two and a half tons and maybe 10 feet in height. Can you explain how this was dealt with? Well, we had a, we had a JCB. A JCB, yeah. A JCB in chain, you see. Yeah, yeah. 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 And where was the big stone taken? The big stone was taken up at College's Depot. College. Mm. That's where all the bricks and, and pavement and all that was stored. And that's where the Holy Stone was stored. Now you mentioned this as the Holy Stone. It was a sacrificial stone. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that one of the councillors who authorised yeah. the removal had a stroke three weeks after. Yeah, because the stone holds a curse. And they laughed at me. Mm. They laughed at me. That stone's got a curse on it. Mm -hmm. It's where it lays now, it's got to stay there forever. Anybody tries to shift it, something does happen. Yeah. Councillor Simmons, he also wanted to be moving. He, he, was, he was the one, was he? Yeah, yeah. he was a heart attack. Yeah, heart attack, yeah. And he got his gun and was going up and breaking up and slam my mate. Put it in his car. Yeah. The third time he did it, he had a heart attack and dropped down dead. You mentioned here that you were acting under the orders of people that are now deceased. A Mr. Pickering, who was the borough yeah, surveyor, the borough survey, yeah. and Mr. Lind was the parks manager at the time, and um, sadly manager, they're yeah. all now deceased. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is that the, the most important capstone, or holy stone, should still be in this Collins's, Collins's yard. yard. Can you describe what this stone looked like? It was about 12, 12 14 foot long. And its girth? About, about three foot wide, three foot six wide. How thick was it? Fifteen inches mm. thick, yeah. Mm. Mm. So it'd be about what three ton maybe? Oh, good, good two ton. Yeah. Two yeah. Ton, yeah. So this stone would have been laying in the council yard up until yes, privatisation, yeah. up to about yeah, the nineties. Yeah. Then when it was privatised, other firms would have taken that yard over and cleaned it out. So therefore, that stone would have been removed yeah, well, or it's disposed it's of. We had to look round that yard. Right. We can't find now, it. Now, ten years ago, when when council services were privatised, it appears that this stone may have gone to Burslands for cutting up. It's very strange that about that time Burslands had a fire, which is unexplained. Yeah, destroyed their destroyed office. and destroyed their front office and everything. Yeah. If this curse yeah, like, is on, then yeah. Explain how it was, yeah. Yeah. was broken up. Yeah. That stone, the councillor, yeah. he had a block of flats built, 
my book gets thrown up and used as hardcore. Oh. And trip me that, that block of that road up, there's a big four in there. But are you saying the big stone, the one we're talking about, was broken up and... Broken up. And used for hardcore? And used for hardcore. So there's no other way of cutting it up. You tried to cut to sledgehammer it and the man died trying to do it. Yeah. So not only did Burstons have a fire, but you're saying that the building that the stone was actually broken up into that and used as hardcore there, yeah. actually caught fire as well. Yeah. They had a fire in this block of flats, you say. Yeah. The discovery in the grove, which is opposite um, Calvary grounds, of what appears to be a, well, we thought an arrowhead, but it's probably a spearhead burial of 120 to 128 people. The Kent Archaeological Society has very kindly done a geophysical survey which has shown very promising reports which could possibly um, give the impression of pagan burials all lying in the same direction as those burials and you can't put the clock back. What we can do is to take the status quo as it is now and try and give the correct history for Tunbridge Wells that does not start at 1600. It starts when the first people were roaming around as hunter-gatherers. However, the amount of burials that are showing up in the area is so phenomenal that there must have been a very large community it here. It was a large community, or, or, yeah. or that the bodies of the dead were being brought to this area for ritual burial mm. and were not reflective of the population. This could explain why there are so few, that I think I'm correct in saying here, Mesolithic, uh, pre-Bronze Age or Iron Age burials found in the country, they have a, a cemetery for Mesolithic people in France, a very big one, whereas over here there's yet anything to be found. This could possibly explain it that Tunbridge Wells is in fact on this particular cemetery. Perhaps it's about time that Tunbridge Wells had an archaeological organisation. I understand it has a very strong civic society. It has a history society who yeah. are right at the We've got too many bloody old fuddy duddies in here. <laughs> That's the trouble with mm. mm. Too many old fuddy duddies. Yeah. Yes, well, there we are. Sadly, it's a sign of the times we live in, and I think that we'll press the button. And, press the button uh, now. Thank you very much, Arthur, for letting us um, yeah, talk to you I'm today. Any time you like. Now we're back to see what secrets lay beneath Bell Grove. This is the first time Peter has physically doused the site. So now what we're going to do, this is called Bell Grove, and I wanted to know about this bit here, why it wasn't allocated as a garden to that house and followed the wall around here, you see? So basically it was protected and I knew there was something buried there, but I couldn't get access to it. So I asked 42 for an unblocking code, which it gave me, so it actually would give me a code for blocking something as well. And, uh, and the map just came alive down here. So I was able to... Uh, map test it. Map test it. Yeah. So I came over and used it. So basically, uh, one of the things I'd like to say, these colours, because they have power values in numbers, can actually be used as radionic number strips. That means you can have, let's say, uh, black and yellow, which is fine's bone, but you can then have a piece of strip which says 10 and 5, and you can work on that. But you have to say 10 and 5 all the time, and you can really hold only one number strip at a time. Whereas if you, like a game of cards, you can hold multiple colour codes. The ferrous system reads these colour codes up into the brain, and into the mind, and therefore causes the para reactions. That's why we have three main magnetic responses, the ferra, the dia, and the para. The dia is the middle bit, and the para are the two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears, everything we've got two of. <laughs> this is the magnetic yeah. sensory system, yeah, system of the system, body. Yes, and Geoffrey yeah. Crockford has, of course, written quite well about this in the Phoenix Point. Qualified archaeologists and the ancient alien series have come to Mesopotamia that uh, they created the modern human form to do the mining for them because we sweat and the other forms couldn't sweat. That was what I understood from the archaeological programs that have been uh, shown. Humanity became divine basically after the Great War which took place ending about 6,000 years ago and they created a truce between two dominant forms and we were left to our own devices and that of course is when the Bible writing started you see. But it's interesting that 
these colours will work on anything. They'll work on the Moon, they'll work on Mars, they'll work down here, and they'll work over maps. What I picked up on Mars was that it had been nuclear war, and I reported that. I actually reported that water was there and nearly everything else had been there and left the marks and stains and only now have they come to the conclusion that nuclear war did take place on Mars because there are certain signatures left which can only be caused by creating nuclear explosions rather than natural nuclear explosions. Now that's not my research, that's the qualified PhD scientists. I interviewed Dr. John Brandenburg, 2015, who spoke about his, at one time, controversial findings of nuclear explosions that had effectively wiped life from the planet Mars. Here is an excerpt of that longer interview. I want to introduce you to Dr. John Brandenburg. He is a plasma physicist and he did his graduate work at California at Lawrence Livermore uh, National Labs in controlled plasma for fusion power. He's also worked in defense energy and space research. Dr. Brandenburg was also part of the Clementine mission to the moon where we discovered water at the moon's poles. The focus of Brandenburg's scientific career has been to complete the great effort of Einstein to unify the two range forces of nature, gravity and electromagnetism. There is evidence, he says also, of two massive nuclear explosions on Mars that occurred above the Martian surface and they were airbursts, turning large areas of the planet's surface into glass and leaving radioactive byproducts which are still visible, he's reported. John, welcome to the Amash Files. How are you? Well, great honor, Joanne. Thank you so much. Well, let's start with the UFO thing, because you were interested as a youngster in things UFO. Honest to God, UFO sightings in Oregon, where I grew up, I saw a quite spectacular one over my town. It was reported in the paper. Everyone else saw it, too. I was very interested in UFOs. So as a young person interested in becoming a scientist, I found that it was much easier just to put that out of my mind. And in fact, it remained out of my mind completely from 1967 to 1984, where I suddenly came face to face with it again. At that time, I was investigating uh, what looked like archaeology on Mars. I was part of the independent Mars investigation team uh, started by Richard Hoagland. These are all recent pictures of the face on Mars, and you can see that it is a face taken in about 2007. Nearby it, there's a pyramid-shaped object. The whole subject of UFOs basically came up by surprise because we were investigating Mars, what looked like a, a dead civilization Mars. on Mars. And so I realized our phone was being tapped, specifically conversations having to do with Mars. I also became aware of this feeling that I was, you know, being watched. And I worked at a government lab. I had a high security clearance. So I was used to dealing with secret things. But this was much different than anything I'd encountered before. We were talking to Carl Sagan, and he asked us for pictures of some of the new stuff we were finding. And I sent those to him and then talked to him a month later and said, what did you think of the pictures? And he said, I never got them. So we realized our mail was being intercepted. And that was when I remember thinking, you know, it's almost as if there is a UFO cover-up and Mars is a sideshow because it's evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, maybe the government already knows there are extraterrestrial civilizations and doesn't want us to know because yeah. we found this stuff on Mars, which even though it isn't a flying saucer, it's evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence close by. And we discovered in the meantime that there was a Mars ocean that was fun. Part of Mars had the vast, smooth plains, and the face on Mars and the pyramid and other things were in these rocky areas right next to these smooth plains, and then we discovered that they were all at the same elevation. So it was a very simple inference to think, oh, it must have been an ocean, and this was on the shore of the ocean. I've investigated further scientifically and found there was a lot of evidence for an ocean on Mars. So. Also, the estimates for water in Mars' atmosphere in the past had been vastly increased so that there was enough water to cover the entire planet to the depth of 200 or 300 meters, and that was enough for an ocean. Okay. The importance of the Martian ocean 
is that it is on the geologically youngest part of Mars. It has almost no craters. Uh, basically, the youngest part of Mars is where the ocean is in the north. That means that ocean with liquid water and all that that implies had to exist on Mars for most of Mars history. That means Mars was Earth-like for most of its history. This is a profound change in our view of Mars. We call this the new Mars synthesis. So we have a concept of Mars that was very Earth-like for most of its history up until recent geologic times, we began to postulate, there were two theories. One was that Mars was colonized by some spacefaring species, and the other was that it had an indigenous life and intelligence had separately evolved on Mars, like on Earth. I tended to pick the latter hypothesis simply because I thought it was more defensible scientifically, is another face we found on Mars. But it shows that there was a widespread civilization on Mars. It wasn't just in one place. And this also was on the ocean shoreline. The second face is at a place called Galaxis Chaos. And that is NASA's name, not our own. And uh, when we first heard this new name, we already knew that NASA was aware we had found another face on Mars and apparently a ruined city nearby, near uh, Utopia Planum. Okay. Then the question was, what happened to Mars? They parachuted a probe into the planet Jupiter and sampled all the isotopes there. And the isotopes looked just like Earth. The xenon-129 was the same as the xenon-132, just like on Earth. So Mars suddenly became much more anomalous because of this. Remember, I was quite haunted by this one person's statement that... This was, a, this was a nuclear weapon signature, Xenon-129. But as it turns out, the Xenon-129 does not come from fusion. It comes uh -huh. from massive amounts of fission of uranium or thorium. I was aware that a standard hydrogen bomb, and they will wrap it with uranium or thorium so that the fusion neutrons, the neutrons released by fusion will actually go out and split the normally inert thorium and uranium and add to the force of the explosion. And they will also create a lot of xenon-129. The change in the Earth's atmosphere due to nuclear testing had been published in about 1992. And you could see that part of the Earth's atmosphere had changed. Uh, xenon is a very small component in the Earth's atmosphere and the atmosphere of Mars it just stays in the air and it preserves kind of the history of the planet in the record of the isotopes of xenon. On Earth, there was this enormous spike in xenon-129 due to nuclear testing. And this had created a lot of xenon-129. And armed with this data, I compared the Mars atmosphere with atmospheric xenon with Earth's xenon shows comparisons between Mars and, and the nuclear component of the Earth's atmosphere. We've changed our own atmosphere because of nuclear testing. Because then you have an amount of xenon-129, you can actually calculate how big the bomb had to be to have done this. What was the nuclear energy release? It's enormous. Uh, a, a billion megatons. A billion? Yes. Oh, God. I wow. know. So this explosion would have torn the entire atmosphere of Mars off of the planet. It would have utterly devastated. It would have sterilized the entire planet. It was so large, it meant that if this was done by some intelligent force, someone wanted to not only destroy the civilization on Mars, but to sterilize the planet so it could really never have life on it again. And you said there were two such explosions yes, the, um, of the same it, magnitude? Yes. And you can see two red spots. Yeah, in indeed. Earth. And those apparently were the sites of two massive nuclear explosions. We also recently discovered they, those two sites are covered with what looks like a glass. And then you can see there's a pattern of yellow that's kind of debris from the explosions. That wraps around the planet and to a place called the Antipode, 
from the larger explosion where there's another smaller pile of radioactive debris indicates the shock wave wrapped all the way around the planet, collided on the far side. The entire planet was devastated. I thought that possibly it could be explained by natural nuclear reactors on Mars. In Africa, there were natural nuclear reactors in the ground, in uranium deposits. And the water would, uh, groundwater would get into the uranium deposits and it would form a natural nuclear reactor with water moderation. And this happened a billion years ago. It happened in 20 separate little spots. And so it was easy to imagine that something like that could have occurred on Mars, uh, only this was much larger, perhaps, and went unstable and blew up. However, I became aware from the comments of uh, various other scientists that the xenon-129 was not the product of a nuclear reactor. So that was one problem. The devil was in the details. Most important detail was xenon-129 was not produced by nuclear reactors. So I was forced gradually by the fact there were no craters at the sites. Whatever happened on Mars, it blew up in midair. And it involved an enormous amount of fission, not just fusion. And it created a lot of xenon-129, like earthly nuclear explosions. So the only thing that matched this was massive nuclear explosions like on Earth in midair. Instead of finding a, a lot of little spots of radioactivity, we found two yeah. big ones. So this meant the bombs had to have been dropped from outer space. It looks as though somebody from space came along and dropped two massive hydrogen bombs on it with the intent of destroying not only the people on the planet, but the entire biosphere. Primary um, thing we've been talking about, the nuclear, effect, nuclear uh, weapons on Mars, that's in death on Mars. It's, uh, so that is, that is for sale every place. Then there's also the science fiction novel, Morningstar Pass, The Collapse of the UFO Cover-Up. Okay. Uh, basically, it turns out the Tesla rotating field, electromagnetic field, is why you see three bumps on the bottom of most UFOs. They have a three-phase rotating field, just like induction motors in in industry on Earth. So that is why they have three bumps on the bottom. Thank you very much indeed. And we are coming to the end of our show. Thank you very much, everyone, Thanks. and uh, John and Stephen. And I'd also reported to uh, the university that we'd found water. And we found it by using dark blue three, responded obviously, and they found water. And I'll tell you this, there's coal there. There were forests there. In other words, it was a mini form of earth. And I think that this is the reason why people came here because they couldn't stay there any longer. So coming here, uh, basically um, the same problem started between factions, it was, expressed to me that some of these craft they never land they're like giant aircraft carriers in space they just go around on a five or six thousand year cycle and they get asteroids and meteors they use the minerals from there they breed they live they die on there everything's recycled they have craft that just launch off of them and we're talking about something that might be 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles they are huge but they're in stealth so somehow our telescopes aren't picking these up, but they would pick up the energy of their emissions if they could only use this system. We're going to pick up where we left off at Bell Grove to see what it is that has been found remotely by map and now on site. We'll see if it matches up. Right, I'm holding this piece of fossilised remain here and I'm just going to see what... I don't want to knock these plants that are coming up here. Oh, there we are, look. So the miners were here. <laughs> so, so this is E.T. again? Yeah, yeah, E.T., yeah, e. this other form, it's not 42. There's about half a dozen of them here. So there we are, there's another one there. So we're coming along here. There's another one here. Now basically, it was an unblocking for that. And I'm going to actually show you something, two things that might point to the reason why this was blocked and I'm not quite sure whether people realise. So those colour codes I was showing you will respond in that area. 
the same as they did over there, you know, this, these colours here. They will respond to this and they respond down there and they're totally different from that up there. So now I'm going to show you something. Right, there are thousands of colours, millions of colours. In fact, every single atom, if it merges with another atom, creates a different colour code for whatever it is. Somebody once said to me, I've got these colours, pale blue, silver and white. Can you tell me what they mean? I thought, well, hang on, I usually know the subject matter first and then colour code them. I said, I've never done it the other way around. So I went back and I racked my brains with 42 and gradually we came out that it's a teacher, the colour for a teacher. So when I went back across the road and I said, I found out what these colours mean. She says, it's a colour. She said, well, that's because the colours I saw coming out of your head as you came in through the door. <laughs> oh, how interesting. And that was the Helios Street healing. System. Oh, the homeopathic. Yeah, homeopathic, yeah. So basically, every single compound a pharmacy uses can be put down to a colour code. And if you've got something in there that shouldn't be in there, they should be able to sensory that there's a problem with it. It's just a continuation, you see. So it is a starship. 42 is a starship. It traverses huge areas of space in actually no time whatsoever. And within it, it has 30 little pods, or we call them orbs or spheres. And they can be in stealth, they can be seen, unseen. They actually, to give you an experiment, I was told that if you invite them, they'll come. I basically so, said, right, you come home. So I had another researcher called Isabel, and I invited them for a particular day at a particular time. We could sense the craft coming in and landing in stealth, just as the experiments we've done, because they will come, and you can sense a craft in another dimension. Anyway, nothing turned up. The craft was there. I could sense them coming out of the craft, they came in the house, but I couldn't pick anything up at all. And of course, we hadn't done the year. <laughs> You've got to have the time, the date and the year. So we rescheduled it for the following day, and indeed they came round. At 7pm they came round. They, they came in the house, I could feel them, they came up to my study, they walked round the house, they came down to the room, the TV was on, uh, they sat in the chairs. And then I felt a slight tap on the head and the visit was over. But then when I picked the cushion up, the only time ever, and we've been in this house over 50 years, when I picked the cushion up, it stuck statically to the cushion next door and I had to pull them apart. So that's the problem with space and time dimension. You can have two people sitting in the same chair and you can have 150 years, 20 years between them and neither will know the other is sitting there. <laughs> but if you pre-programmed it then you will know and of course the evidence is that they fuse the static electricity between one and the other and Isabel said I looked in that craft last evening at time I couldn't find anything in it I said no Isabel because at that time they were around here <laughs> and I was told that that is the standard thing a 15 minute visit about five minutes to get there five minutes in the place five minutes to go and you get a little tap on the so side time and, and a lady came it. and she said them aren't you worried about this and I said no, not at all. I find it, you know, thrilling. It's a search for knowledge, you know. Found in the 16 symbols that you can spell the letters Orion out of it, which makes sense as Orion is the most important thing archaeologically all around the world. And that the spelling of Orion in the letter positions add up to 45. Well, here we have, if you look in the 26 letter alphabet that we have in America, the UK and anybody that speaks English, you'll see the letters UFO, if you take them out and add them up in their positions, add up to 42. <laughs> Interesting. So people know about this, so they're using the letters as secret mind messages. So we'll just come round here and I think you'll see what I'm getting at. Although I'm not complaining, <laughs> I'm just saying that some people know a lot. I discover everything. The pub on the edge of the grove. <laughs> Come round here. Stained glass windows. Oh, I see. Right. And then we'll come round here. It's number 45. <laughs>
Yes, it's a postal address 45 up there, you see? Yeah. <laughs> the Orion code. <laughs> Fascinating. On the edge of a grove that has 42s in it. <laughs> That I only sort of tottened on to uh, quite a few years later. I thought, well, every, all roads lead to Rome, don't they? <laughs> well, nothing well, I'm not for sure no reason. Whether they know? Because no, probably the they don't. Don't go. Go and have a smoothie and. Uh, yes, we'll go uh, home and have some refreshment. Ten to one, yeah. Cup yeah, of tea. Yeah, yeah. So um, there we are. Absolutely so, how fascinating. You, how you cope with this? You know, I've always been sort of enthralled by it and I always look at things so when for instance something happened like Salisbury um, people ask me for the codes and I'm able to extract them and give them to them by going asking 42 so when the Salisbury attack took place basically I asked 42 for the code for Novacek which they gave me and we were and able that's to that's another story another